morning, and everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Corey McFarland, Deputy Director of the Door County Department of Health and Human Services. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by the Door County Mental Health Focus Group. The Mental Health Focus Group is a public health initiative and is comprised of many community organizations and individuals who are interested in issues related to mental health. We try every May to have a community uh, awareness event um, because May is Mental Health Month. And because we're still dealing with a bit of COVID, um, we are having tonight's event virtually. Um, we are focusing on anxiety tonight. And the reason that we're um, choosing that as a focus is that uh, if COVID taught us anything, it's that anxiety is all around us. I think COVID provoked some anxiety for some people. And as we are moving towards um, somewhat returning to normal, uh, as we talk to community partners and schools and therapists, we hear from all sorts of people that um, anxiety is really heightened even more at this point, um, ranging from simple worry to all out panic for some people as they think about getting back into kind of the swing of things. Uh, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States affecting about 40 million adults age 18 and over or 18.1% of the population. So it's really prevalent. So it's an important issue for us. Um, we're going to spend tonight, um, we're gonna to start out with just a short video clip. Um, then I will introduce our panelists. We have a longer video, about 14 minutes, um, that we'll watch together as well. And then we're going to lead into a discussion with our panelists. Thanks for sharing that clip. I think it's a good introduction to what we're going to be talking about tonight. So I'd like to just introduce our three panelists um, who are mental health professionals. You could each wave when I introduce you. First, we have Donna Alta-Peter. Donna is a licensed clinical social worker, and she's the manager of the Door County Department of Health and Human Services Behavioral Health Division. And then we have Ellie Brettel, also an LCSW, and she is a Door County native who recently returned to her roots here in Door County. Uh, and Ellie works as a therapist at Door County Medical Center. She also treats students in the Sturgeon Bay School District through STRIDE, our Mental Health in the Schools initiative. And then we have Jody Gonzalez, who is owner of Jody Rose Studios in Northern Door County. She's an artist, art therapist, and yoga instructor. And she holds credentials from the Art Therapy Credentials Board, National Board of Certified Counselors, and International Yoga Alliance. And as we go along, um, each of these panelists will share a little bit more about um, their practice and what they see in terms of uh, treating anxiety. Um, so we were gonna, we're gonna jump in now with some discussion with our panelists. And we have a number of questions that were put together by members of the Mental Health Focus Group. So we're gonna jump right in and I will ask um, various members of the panel to take the lead on some of these questions and others may join in. So the first question I'm gonna um, pitch to Donna first. Uh, anxiety has different faces. Jordan speaks specifically to situational anxiety, social anxiety, and high functioning anxiety. From your perspective as a mental health practitioner, can you talk a little bit about how you see these different types or levels of anxiety exhibited in the individuals you serve? Sure. So in our mental health clinic, probably the um, one of the more um, most often seen um, diagnosis with anxiety is what I would call generalized anxiety disorder. This is a anxiety disorder where um, the client experiences anxiety pretty much all the time. Um, it, it can be low level and it can escalate under certain circumstances, but most of the time they're anxious. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is a diagnosable disorder. It's a disorder that's treated um, oftentimes with both medication, short acting and long acting um, anxiety medication, as well as some behavioral interventions, which we'll, we can talk about later. But it's a very common disorder and it can be very impairing for people because in every aspect of their life, people with generalized anxiety disorder uh, feel anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, Social anxiety is another um, commonly experienced um, anxiety that we, and we see it in our clinic. Uh, this is specific to social situations. Um, people function pretty well in 
certain situations, but when they anticipate things like family gatherings, um, uh, business gatherings, um, parties, um, meeting new people in large gatherings, something other than a one-on-one, -on -one, um, it, it can be pressuring and difficult for people to manage. So a social anxiety is not uncommon at all. And again, um, it's um, very impairing and it can respond to um, certain interventions as well. The um, last two that I'd point out is situational, which are really specific um, experiences of anxiety. We don't see a lot of that, frankly, in our clinic. Um, it's not uh, the kind of thing that people feel completely impaired with because it is specific to situations. It may be something like for job interviews, first day of school, um, jitters with a date, right? Performance anxiety, th things like a recital, um, things that people feel are pretty normal um, in terms of the human experience with anxiety. And then lastly, high functioning anxiety is um, termed that way because people um, utilize anxiety in a sense as a, as, a, um, as a source that propels them rather than paralyzing them. So high functioning anxiety is not something we generally um, treat either in our clinic. It's not a diagnosable uh, uh, disorder, uh, although it can get to one end of the spectrum where it might be impairing, where people feel a lot of pressure, perfectionistic um, tendencies, and um, desire to look really good, even though internally um, they're experiencing a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. So high functioning um, anxiety though is um, generally works under the theory that um, people with mild to, mo a mild to moderate amount of anxiety um, find that it's helpful. It motivates them, it gets them going. And the theory behind this is that we all need a little bit of anxiety to get something done. Um, people with too much anxiety could be paralyzed with it and people with not enough may never get out of bed. So the idea behind high functioning anxiety is that it does propel people and um, brings them to a point of um, getting things done. So those are the four areas I would, um, I just wanted to cover briefly. Thanks, Dana. Allie or Jody, you have anything you'd like to add to that? Looks like Allie's reaching for the microphone. Um, go ahead, Allie. Go ahead, Allie. I work with individuals who may or may not have a diagnosable level of anxiety. Um, that's often a byproduct of too much stress, like anxiety has evolved from chronic stress and lack of coping skills. This could be related to work-life balance issues, um, things like a lack of clarity of purpose in life, um, or people who are going through life transitions like a career or college choice, divorce, uh, retirement, moving, the, the big major life stressors are where people seek clarity. Um, among youth, uh, primarily I see social anxiety, um, performance, you know, school tests, school performance related anxieties. Um, and then uh, I also um, previously have worked with women and children who have eating disorders and substance abuse disorders. And so their um, anxiety is often trauma related underlying um, with these other co-occurring disorders. And so for those individuals, there is an inherent sense of lack of physical or emotional safety um, due to trauma. And so it does, anxiety is so multidimensional and can be interwoven with other things. So it's, um, important to be able to look at it from different angles if, if you feel or you know someone who is experiencing symptoms. Well, that's a good point, Jody, too, to mention that it's, it definitely, um, most times it's co-occurring, right, with, mm. with either some sort of addiction or another mental health, mental burn. So that could, this could also be masked by something else as well, or it could be masking other symptoms as well.
Um, Jody, I'm going to ask you to take the lead on the next one. So what would you say is considered a normal amount of anxiety and when does it get into that abnormal range? You know, this is a really interesting question. And I thought before directly answering about normal versus abnormal to briefly talk about sources of anxiety because it is so broad. It could be a response to medication. Um, it could be a result of chronic or ongoing stress. It could be, you know, biologically speaking, anxiety stems from activation of the nervous system. Um, and so as previously mentioned, it could be related to a trauma or um, other event. We've talked about situational anxiety. Um, we um, honor that um, normal anxiety can also be a normal byproduct of like a life challenge, a performance, um, you know, public speaking. Um, so we have to like really look at um, what are the sources of anxiety before answering what is normal. But I think to look at what is abnormal, it's like, is it affecting your daily functioning? Um, you know, are you able to do your day-to-day -day tasks, like go to the store or are you calling in sick for work um, or for school? Um, are you medicating? So, you know, um, medicating is, it can be anything used beyond moderation to numb or to distract yourself. And so it could, obvious things are food, alcohol, video games, social media, sex, shopping, it's any, it could be anything. Um, and if you realize that um, you're leaning into those things at a level um, to try to quiet quiet yourself and calm yourself that's like far outside of normal um, for you. And also if your normal self-care things that you like to do aren't working anymore, these are all signs that, um, you know, that there's an abnormal amount of anxiety in your life. Um, I mentioned that you work with students in um, Sturgeon-based schools through Stride, and I know you see children in your office as well. How can you tell if a child has anxiety? Does that look any different than with an adult? Um, am I still, am I, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm frozen and cause you guys are frozen. Um, so super good question, Corey. I would say yes and no. A lot of, I, a lot of what Jody just mentioned, um, for, for potential symptoms could definitely be seen in children, but just to further expand that, I would say decreasing grades in school or decreasing attendance or decreasing participation, um, in classes. I've also, um, I've seen, that's, that's a, that's a big one that I've seen in kids thus far. Um, I have like tense shoulders, could be anxiety. Um, and I, different, right? So what, um, what may be true for one, it may not be true for the other. Um, I guess to also build on that, I would say some sort of increased irritability as well, right? So I recently um, saw a young man who was struggling with outbursts and um, his dad said, I have, I, I have a kid and he's really, really angry. And I was like, no, he's just really anxious. And that's how it comes out. Um, so I also would include some sort of, um, irregular eating, right? So we no normal, normally like kids have a pretty structured eating schedule, right? Like breakfast before school, lunch during school, some, some dinner after, after school. So not e eating, um, what they should be, stuff like that. Any, just some of this thing thus far. Thank you for that. Um, Jody, is it common for children or adults to be misunderstood for their behaviors when maybe they're actually experiencing anxiety? I think Allie just gave us one great example, but do you have others? Um, I think so. I, I've worked not only with kids, but adults with developmental disability, senior citizens with um, dementia, people with brain trauma. Um, I think especially with people who are nonverbal or people who don't have strong verbal communication skills, um, 
the, they don't have the capacity necessarily to explain that they're feeling anxious. So you definitely see that come out as less desirable behaviors, emotionality, attention deficit, um, or pushback. Um, and I think also with um, in youth, um, you know, sometimes kids don't know that they have anxiety. They just think that something's wrong. They're feeling weird. They start to tell themselves that they're different from other kids. They try to hide it and cope with it on their own. And then you start to see a behaviors um, like cutting or eating disorder or substance use where they're trying to control the anxiety. So sometimes, um, you know, the behavior is really trying to divert away from the anxiety symptoms if they don't feel that they're in a comfortable position to express that this is what's going on. So this is where education and conversations like this are so important um, to talk to kids, like what is the physical sensation? You know, what sort of things are they experiencing? And to let them know that especially, you know, in times of high stress and change, um, that, that the, this is how the body responds and then give them tools to actually um, cope. On the other side of that, also, like I explained to a lot of kids that parents are grumpy <laughs> because they might be anxious, especially during the, the pandemic. So overall, I think it is pretty common um, to, to judge or misunderstand people based on behavior. The only thing I would add is related to what Jody talked about earlier, um, that um, oftentimes anxiety is related to trauma. Um, and unidentified trauma um, often <laughs> that people don't, um, they haven't seen it as trauma or they don't identify it as trauma. And that anxiety um, has played a part in their life, all their life. Um, and um, commonly is, uh, people uh, resort to self-medicating. Mm -hmm. um, and often this is with drug and al alcohol. So, um, and people think of that as a normal way of managing anxiety um and a, a eating too um mm -hmm. so a, a lot of you know not functional behaviors um but many times people think because it relieves or helps in the moment to relieve the anxiety that it is it works mm -hmm. right what we end up seeing though is that people then end up with problems with substance use or problems with um, binge or overeating disorders or anorexia for that matter. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different ways that people try to manage it, their anxiety, particularly related to trauma that feels like it gives them immediate relief, but long-term gets them deeper into um, problems with functioning. So that's just something I would, I would add and mention in terms of um, thinking about in people's own individual situations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Donna. I'd like to shift gears just a little bit and talk about um, some of the interventions um, that might be available for people that are dealing with anxiety, um, coping skills that can help, and just general activities and resources that are available in the community that, that might help. So Donna, why don't you start us out? Sure. Um, one of the most common ways that anxiety is treated is through medication. There's short acting and long acting medication that people prescribe, primary providers prescribe and psychiatrists. Um, the thing to be aware of with short acting anti-anxiety medication is that it is addictive and it is something that we build tolerance to. Um, so the long acting medication can be effective for people that have ongoing problems with anxiety that impairs their functioning. Um, but anxiety is one of those things that it always, um, with treatment, it works best in tandem with behavioral interventions as well. Mm -hmm. So your medication is, um, I view it as a way of getting the soil ready and, and then the behavioral medication, I'm sorry, the behavioral interventions are all the things that um, really help the flower grow once the soil is kind of ready. Um, so behavioral interventions range from um, cognitive interventions, um, positive self-talk, um, use of relaxation exercise, uh, physical exercise, um, uh, 
relaxation, things like breathing, also things like art, um, music, um, and some of those I, I, I'll ask for Jody to speak to because she mm -hmm. offered some of those interventions in her practice. Um, and then a couple other basic things for anxiety is really good sleep hygiene. Um, mm -hmm. Key, watching caffeine intake is key. It can, it can be, it can be life-changing if you mm -hmm. um, can really pay attention to those things as well. Yeah, well, both to add on, but also tag off of um, Donna's comments about um, coping mechanisms that may not be helpful. How do you know what is helpful and what isn't? And fundamentally, anxiety evolves from a stimulation of the nervous system. It's activated and it's related to fight or flight response. So two points here. One, your body is cranking out hormones that are telling you to move, to fight or to fly. It, it, and so what's the problem in our society is like things are complicated and it's not, we're not being chased by a bear usually. Um, and it's not socially acceptable, you know, to, to act out or to act upon or the, the things that our bodies are telling us to do. So we get this flood of, of stress hormones. Um, and then um, the other thing to note is that if we're anxious in part because the nervous system is activated, then it follows that we would use methods to deactivate the nervous system. And I call those biologically relevant um, coping skills or tools. So, and that's where the things like breathing and yoga, um, creativity, those all demonstrate a measurable reduction in the stress hormone cortisol. Um, they demonstrate brave brain, brain <laughs> brainwave pattern shifts from active brainwave states that often occur um, during like a panic attack or um, with high anxiety they, to shifting towards a calm brainwave state. Um, and so there are just, there are numerous ways that you can um, do things that are calming. And there are so many resources now on the internet, um, you know, meditations, guided imagery. This is where the art therapy coloring book is helpful because um, that has the calming um, effect. effect. Um, so this is where there are a lot of things between medication um, and a diagnosable condition that you can do um, that are um, much more helpful than the Band-Aid things that we typically use for, <laughs> for medicating. It's so much easier to maybe just numb out on, on social media, but to take the time to um, go for a walk or to breathe deeply or to do those things that seem almost overly simplistic. Like if they have, if, if there's tons of research that demonstrates the calming effect on the body and that makes them good interventions. So in, in my practice, I offer um, both the art therapy and then also um, the, the yoga classes and yoga is often mis perceived as an exercise program in our culture, but it can also be in how I teach it is specifically through a mental health lens, both for stress reduction and for treating anxiety. Just to kind of uh, talk a little bit about the aging population, because we have a really rapidly aging population in Door County, clearly. And I'm just wondering how anxiety shows up in that population. And are there specific resources and tools that might be available to the older Americans? Be helpful. So here in Dora County, um, I think a primary and important resource is the um, Aging and um, Disability Resource Center, the ADRC, uh, which is part of our department, but it's housed separately. Um, it, they provide a variety of activities for um, aging and disabled adults, um, including uh, meals, meal delivery, um, exercise, socialization, um, lots of activities, games, um, interactions um, throughout the year that really can provide a connection, a social connection, as well as ways for people to engage in healthy behaviors that really help encourage them um, develop good habits um, in their life. Um, and we at, at Door County Health and Human Services and the Behavioral Health um, Unit refer a lot of people there um, because it's, it is such a resource for people who oftentimes 
their anxiety um, stems from isolation or adaptation to new circumstances that they're having difficulty adjusting to. So death of a spouse, family members that have moved, um, retirement, loss of job. Um, I, I think about a, a retired farmer who really had um, a really hard time adjusting to um, no longer farming, right? So the, um, the difficulties that come with normal transitions are not always so normal. They're, they're difficult. So the ADRC can really help. And then our clinic also um, in providing support um, in behavioral interventions as well as potential um, medication uh, management um, can be of some benefit for uh, the aging population as well. So yeah, at Door County Medical Center, we have what's known as uh, Senior Life Solutions. It's for anybody um, age 65 or older, um, and it's known as an intensive program, meaning that um, patients within the program meet multiple hours a day, multiple days a week. And that the, the number um, is dependent on what you agree to or what the staff feels like you might need um, when you complete the intake process. So it's for any any um, older adult who is struggling in terms of mental health, but also socialization. Like Donna said, it's um, that's certainly certainly part um, of difficulty within the, the aging population, especially alone. Stab at this one too, um, and I think you've all touched upon this a little bit. But um, in the film, Jordan talks about um, how her anxiety really helps her to be good in some high stress situations. Um, or really good in crisis. So I'm just curious to know um, your perspectives on how or if anxiety can be a strength or can be helpful to people. I'll go first since we're on a roll with my internet. <laughs> um, I would say it definitely could be, right? Like there are moments where our anxiety can propel us forward, right? There, are, and you know the phrase, good ner- some, good, some are, are good nerves, right? Like in order for us to get through that hurdle of public speaking or the little butterflies in our stomach when we get anxious, that's telling us something, right? I always like to tell my patients to trust your gut, right? And like sometimes your gut screaming at you, oh, I'm a little bit anxious for a good reason. And so checking yourself as to why that reason might be. Um, I think it definitely can be seen as a strength. Um, I like to share with clients to shift their mindset towards um, exploring anxiety as a signpost. Like anxiety can be a reminder and a signal that something's out of balance. Your work life is out of balance. There's too much stress. Maybe on some level, you're hanging out with folks that you don't feel emotionally safe with. Maybe it's a cue that you're in the wrong job or relationship. Um, So before thinking of anxiety as this evil bad that is uncomfortable and we don't want to have it, you know, embrace it as your body's biology of trying to keep you safe. Fundamentally, that's what the nervous system activation is doing. And so, you know, to be curious about it, like, you know, and to be... Um, open to going into it a little bit can be extremely helpful. Think of that one. Yeah, I, I think of it a lot like the way Jody described it. And I think about it when you're on a really busy highway in rain, you're hypervigilant, right? You're really looking carefully and you're on a, 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 in a heightened state and it's not comfortable, um, but it's what keeps you safe. Mm-hmm. So um, so I think, I do think about it. Uh, that's what I think of. I think about being on that highway and what keeps us safe and what keeps us alert um, is anxiety. So it is that physiological response um, to the stress that surrounds us on the highway and the trucks coming by really fast and the rain pouring down and, and being um, much more astute to our surroundings so that we can protect ourselves. So I think it's really important to look at those things as signs and signals about our safety. Um, you know, and I, I would like to share, I've experienced anxiety in a bunch of different um, facets. And honestly, my life is better for it. um, Because I've learned to use it as a signpost, um, because it forces me to slow down, I use the coping skills, the things that I teach the yoga and creativity. Um, I don't want to numb out the anxiety. I need to know that it's there because then I can experience life more fully. 
um, I can have richer relationships. And, you know, I just really encourage people to really examine their mindset and not be afraid of it, you know, not be afraid of the discomfort and to know that there are many, many solutions. Um, just want to kind of close out this portion with what should somebody do if they think they or somebody that they care about needs treatment for anxiety? Donna, let me ask you. Well, I always, we try to encourage people to start with their primary providers. Yeah. So um, it's always a good idea to talk to your physician uh, and get a thorough physical to make sure that there aren't other things that are happening um, health-wise that might be promoting anxiety. Anxiety can be very much related to things like the thyroid disorder. Mm -hmm. um, there are physiological um, connections um, that might need to be ruled out. So I would say always start with your physician. Physicians can make referrals then to people in the community that are more specialized uh, for treatment, but they're a really good place to start. Well, I, you know, I, I wanted to well, go back to the question about the resources in the community, um, you know, and I guess what I was struggling to bridge in, in adding on to um, any, any comments about what you should do if you think that you need treatment. It's like, what other resources can you try leading up to that? So not, you know, not necessarily self-treating or self-diagnosing, but based on the conversation that we've had about um, activation of the nervous system, all of the different types of situations that can create anxiety. Our community has, if you stop and think about it, a bazillion resources outside of um, you know, a, a counselor's office to get you started moving in the right direction with calming activities. We have parks and beaches, like movement. And Donna had said this earlier, movement is so important. And going back to how the body is kicking out the stress hormones, those are usually metabolized in, in fight or flight because you're fighting or you're fleeing. Um, so it's really important to get movement to help to um, move, move those um, stress hormones out and be metabolized. So go to the beach, walk the beach, go to the park. Um, isolation is, is common with anxiety. So um, connecting with a friend at a coffee shop, but don't get coffee, get like decaf. <laughs> um, you know, we know that art, um, creativity helps. So aside from going to an art therapy workshop, which I teach like through self-discovery and personal growth lenses, there's the art school, there's hands-on art gallery. Um, there are studio or studies that demonstrate that looking at art is calming to the body. So we have galleries in the Miller Art Museum. Um, there's just, there's so many, the thing is to give yourself permission to take the time. So if your anxiety is coming from a work-life balance issue, um, you know, give yourself permission to do these things as self-care. And sometimes we think it's, again, simplistic or not worth it. Um, but if we think about taking the time as strategic and prescriptive, and like, you, like you're going to a gallery, you're going to do something you enjoy um, and to take advantage of this wonderful place that we live, um, there's um, so much. So I Well, if not, I really want to thank you for taking the time tonight to talk with us about anxiety. Um, and some, some great ideas that any of us can use because um, as we've discovered, anxiety is kind of normal for a lot of us and we can all probably benefit from some of the ideas we heard about tonight. So thank you.